Welcome everyone to the Q&A session for our upcoming course, Transforming Your Life Through Near-Death Experiences, the five-week course to experience guided near-death journeys that will support you to release beliefs and fears that have kept you from living fully and joyfully. My name is Nadira Ade, and I am pleased to be hosting this hour-long Q&A call for the SHIFT Network, where we will explore the teachings of Anita Morjani and address questions about her upcoming course, which begins next Tuesday, June 25th. Later, I will explain how you can participate in this course, even if you can't attend the live sessions. But first, I am so honored to introduce our guest. Anita Morjani is an international speaker and the author of the New York Times bestseller, <laughs> Dying to Be Me, and her latest book, What If This Is Heaven? And she has a remarkable story. After a four-year battle with cancer, Anita fell into a coma and was given days to live. As her doctors gathered, attempting to revive her, she journeyed into a near-death experience, also known as an NDE, in which she was surrounded by unconditional love and deep wisdom. In this place, she was given a powerful truth. Heaven is not a destination. It is a state of consciousness. During her NDE, Anita was given the choice to return to her physical form or to continue on into this expansive new realm. She chose to come back, and we are so grateful, and we benefit for that. When she regained consciousness, the cancer that had caused her organs to shut down began to heal. To the amazement of her doctors, she was free of countless tumors and cancer indicators within a matter of weeks. In just a few moments, we're going to open up for your questions. But first, I want to welcome Anita, who will begin our call by leading us in an opening meditation. Anita, welcome to the call. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Nadiria, for that wonderful welcome. And I am so happy to be here, so excited to be doing this, to be doing the course and doing this hour long live Q&A with you. But before we get started, I just wanted to ask everybody who's tuned in, who's watching to just for two minutes, just hold the space so that the answers that you most need that are for your highest good will come to you. So just for just for a moment, just close your eyes and just listen to my words and just relax, relax your mind and your muscles and see your tensions just float away. Now I'd like you to imagine a strong beam of light coming from above your head and it's so powerful and strong and it's entering you through the crown and then it's filling your body. Allow that beam of light to take on any color that it chooses. And I want you to now imagine or know that this beam of light is your connection to the all that is. You are connected. And for the next hour or so, you will receive what you, whatever you most need to hear. And you will gain the messages for whatever is your highest good. So if you have time over the next hour, please tune in because this is not me speaking to you or over the next hour. The questions that will come up, which I have no idea what they are, will be the questions that are for the good of the most, most of the people listening. So now I just want you to allow that beam of light expand within you, within your own body, so that it creates an aura. It spills out of your body and creates this huge aura that continues to expand. And see it expanding beyond the room and touching other people in the world so that all our auras overlap as we all come together on this call. And know that I am in service to you and I am here to answer your questions the best that I can. And whenever you're ready, open your eyes and we can get started. That was beautiful. 
And I just want to let everyone know that we've got a lot of amazing, beautiful, depthful questions. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. Um, but we're going to use the rest of our time to dive into the questions as we prepare for the course. And again, it begins next Tuesday, June 25th. If at any time during this call you want to learn more about this five-week course, please visit ndetransformation.com and you can see the full description there. And let's get started with the questions. First, if you have questions for our customer service department, you can contact them directly at support dot the shift network dot com. If you have questions for Anita and you are watching over the broadcast, just type them in and we will start to deliver them. The first question is from Deborah, who says, because of your NDE, what feelings or experiences do you revert to to get you through challenging times? And thank you for the generosity of your experience. Oh, that's a great question. So what feelings or experiences do I revert to to get me through challenging times? So number one, I want to say that challenging times um, don't stop happening just because I've had an NDE. And this is the case no matter what kind of transformation you've been through, um, whether you've had a spiritual awakening, kundalini experience, whatever it is, whether you meditate, challenges don't stop coming. That's just the nature of life. So the number one thing I do is that I don't judge myself. So one of the things that you will notice about me is that um, for me, in many cases, it's not a case of what do I do, but it's more about what have I stopped doing. So what my near-death experience taught me is that um, what adds to the challenge is my own judgment towards myself. And people who are on this journey, people who go um, through courses like this and people who read books and who, um, who are always trying to improve themselves and help themselves, we tend to be our harshest critic. We tend to judge ourselves. And whenever we're going through a challenge, we are beating ourselves up, saying things like, oh, I should know better than this. What have I missed? What have I not gotten? Or, what is it I'm doing wrong? So the first thing I would do is stop beating myself up and I will tell myself, as long as I am in human form, I am going to face challenges. So stop judging myself for having the challenge. And it's incredible how much relief you can feel when you stop judging yourself, when you realize that's what you're doing. The second thing I would do is I would actually love myself more through the challenge. Um, loving myself more means allowing myself to feel what I'm feeling, whether it's fear or whatever it is, but without judgment. Again, it's always without judgment. Um, and when I say love myself, what I mean is the, the main thing about loving myself is doing it without judgment. And the other thing is treating myself like I would if it was someone else. And here's the third thing I would do. Um, I would imagine that it was, imagine if it was someone else coming to you and saying that I am going through this challenge. How would you treat them? What would you do for them? Make a list of things, like just pretend. Pretend it was your own child that came to you and said, I am going through this challenge. Or your best friend that came to you and said, I am going through this challenge. Make a list of what would you say to them? What would you do for them? How would you support them? Now look at that list and do those things for yourself. We tend to not treat ourselves as well as we treat other people. And that was the one big lesson I learned in my near-death experience. I learned that I was the one that had always been beating myself up and being hard on myself. And that's what I've changed. So thanks for that great question. Thank you. This next question is from Natalia who says, Dear Anita, why, if life on the other side is so beautiful, do we come into this physical world where there is so much suffering? Why can't we just stay on the other side forever? I do not always succeed in creating joy and love while I'm here on earth. Is it at all possible to have it all the time anyway? And I really miss the freedom and beauty of this other side world you describe. Thank you for being here with us and I love you very much. Aw, thank you for that question. And for those of you who know me, you know my short answer is we come here to eat chocolate. Um, 
but a more deeper, longer answer would be we actually come here to experience life. So um, I agree, it's absolutely beautiful on the other side. There is a lot of freedom on the other side. And, but the thing is, when we cross over, what we take with us is the experience, the experiences from this side. If we didn't have the experiences from this side, even the other side, the other realm, would have less meaning for us. It would hold less meaning. But when we can see the whole picture, or when we are aware that there is more to us than just a physical being, then the pain actually feels less because we realize that this is part of the experience. So for example, after I had the near-death experience and I actually chose to come back because I now kind of understood the big picture and I chose to come back, I realized that coming into life was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to experience duality as opposed to oneness or non-duality. In non-duality, there are no opposites. Um, everything just is. Uh, there's no strife, there's no drama, which is a, a, probably a really good thing. But there's also, um, you don't know the intensity of human love and passion the way you do here, because everything is just love. So there's no contrast. And so what I mean by no opposite is that there's no contrast. There's no pain, so you don't know the feeling of pleasure and relief and joy. Um, you can say it's joyful all the time, but it's more like there is a lack of pain. There is a lack of fear. Um, and so that feeling is of lightness and elevatedness. But there isn't that gratitude that we feel here when things are going well. There isn't that feeling of, let's say, when you give birth to a child or when you fall in love with somebody. Um, those, those feelings aren't, don't exist there in the way they do here. And we take these experiences with us over there and we evolve as, um, I guess, as souls, as, as essences, as um, spirits. We actually evolve. And so we come here to accumulate experiences. And my views on things like um, karma and retribution and, and all this kind of stuff to do with the afterlife change drastically. And I will get to that um, either if there's questions about it or, um, or during the course. I will get to all those things. But really the reason we come here is to experience and even the pain, even though we're not, you know, it's, we're not supposed to live a life that is full of pain. We tend to gravitate towards joy, just like a flower um, gravitates towards the sun. That's our natural state. So our work is to help ourselves to find that joy. And the way we do that is by being who we are. But at the same time, we need the deep pain in order to feel the joy. You don't feel the joy as much unless you've come through pain. And I remember that when I came out of the NDE, because I was so looking forward now to living my life knowing this truth, that when we were going through a, a period of suffering, we went through a period of huge financial difficulty because um, I wasn't working and neither was Danny. I just had cancer for four years. And I remember actually saying to the universe or to God or to whatever we want to call it, I remember saying, thank you for this opportunity because I knew that I was fine because I'd experienced death and that was beautiful. And I knew that is the worst case scenario. And I'm getting the opportunity to feel this struggle because every struggle makes us more compassionate. It makes us more empathetic to other people going through similar struggles. And I actually remember saying that, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be here, even to experience that pain. So, that's, uh, yeah, so thank you for that question. That's a great question. Thank you. This next question is from Debbie, who says, 
My mom passed a year and a half ago. I feel her regrets the same as when she was alive. I still feel like I need to reassure her, but I have a lot of rage, I think, deeply in my body. It's so deep and hard to get in touch with, so much unresolved pain. Is it true that she's at peace now, being that she's not in her body? It doesn't feel like she is, although I feel her deep love and caring. Thank you. So that's another great question. So it is absolutely true that she is in a place of peace, but if she is experiencing any kind of, um, um, I, I don't want to use a strong word, because, but if she is experiencing any kind of concern, it would be a concern for you. In other words, you don't need to be concerned for her. What she would want for you right now is she would want for you to heal. She would want for you to heal her rage. If she is the reason for the rage, um, she wants you to know that she completely, she is absolutely sorry that she caused any of it, if she is indeed the cause of it. She, from her state right now, where she is right now, she is in a state of pure, unconditional love. There is no way that from that realm, in that state that her spirit, her soul is in right now, that she could feel any kind of rage or anger or animosity or anger or, um, uh, or anything negative towards you because it just doesn't exist when we are in that state. All of that is part of being in this physical, in this, um, in this world of duality. So all she feels for you is pure, unconditional love. And she would want you to know that. If you could hear her right now, that's what she would want you to know. And she would want to guide you, um, if you remained open to it, the kinds of messages you would be getting are messages that are guiding you to release that rage and anger in whatever way it takes. Whether it means getting a punching bag and punching it out and just getting it out of your system or going to a, a healer and where they can help you to release that rage by doing various different um, energy transformational work. But basically, um, all she desires for you is for you to heal. And what you are picking up right now is not her being unsettled or anything like that, but what you're picking up is your own rage combined with her wanting you to know that she loves you unconditionally and that she wants you to heal yourself. That's all she wants for you. She wants you to find joy and happiness again. And she would want you to know that she never, ever, ever meant to hurt you. Thank you for that. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is from Donna, who says, I love you, Anita. Aww. You are a treasure to us all. If someone is sick or in pain, how can they access the other side's beautiful energies when they can't meditate or lift their own energy high enough to connect on a vibrational level? Um, so, well, well, first of all, thank you for your message. Love you right back. And um, when somebody is sick, all they have to do is close their eyes, close their eyes and ask for it because we are connected all the time. You're never not connected, never, never, never. The only difference between people who appear to be connected and those who don't are that the ones who appear to be connected know they're connected and the other ones don't know they're connected. But there is nobody who's not connected. As long as you're alive, you're living, you've got life behind your eyes, you've got life force energy coursing through you, you are connected. You're connected to the universe, to God, to the oneness. Um, you are connected and you can access it. And even if you don't feel your energy raising right away, the first thing is to be aware of your connection. Um, and all you have to do is close your eyes. What helps me um, and the way I work with a lot of people is I use visualization. So I would suggest you actually using visuals that work for you, but um, I would even, and this is something I'm going to do in, in my course, is I'm actually going to help people to direct life force energy into their bodies, into the various parts of their bodies where they need the most healing to, to uplift the cells and to kind of surround those cells with loving healing energy. 
And so sometimes it can be a little bit of a process to slowly get it through. But energy is something that is, um, um, th this is the bit of a, a bit of a dichotomy which I want to articulate properly. Energy can get into our bodies and, um, and uplift us in a split second. It doesn't take any time. We can uplift people um, on the other side of the room, on the other side of the world with our energy. And energy has no boundaries. The boundary comes from our mind. It's about getting the mind, I guess, out of the way. And I don't like saying out of the way because when you try to push your mind out of the way, it fights back. What I tend to do is I work with people to satiate their mind so that their mind relaxes. So it's not about pushing the mind out of the way. Feed the mind what it needs to satiate it so that it can relax and then we can allow the energy to go through. Um, so basically, you can raise your energy you can visualize energy coming down because it is, but you allow it by giving your mind. So when we visualize, we are satiating our mind so that our mind can relax so that the energy can do the work it needs to do. So your only work is not about trying to figure out how do I access the energy, but it's about satiating the mind so that your body can access the energy it needs. Thank you. Haley would like to know, even though I am a healer myself and understand spiritual concepts, I have a fear of dying and also being lost physically and losing my identity. Could this course help release these fears? And thank you. Yes, definitely the course could help release the fears because one of the main um, one of the main themes or one of the main things about the course is that um, it is to help you release the fear of dying. Because for me, wh what happened is when I lost the fear of dying, I lost the fear of living. And it is so related because when you fear dying, you don't live your life to the fullest. You don't allow yourself to be seen. You don't allow yourself, you don't take yourself out there. You don't, um, you, you don't make yourself vulnerable, things like that, when you have this fear of dying. Because um, when you fear dying, it's not just a physical death. You fear, um, you fear your ego dying, you fear shame, you fear all these other things. But it was, um, it, it was, the transformation was quite incredible. And that's what I hope to share with people, or not hope, but I will share with people during this course. But the main aim is to lose their fear of dying so that they can lose their fear of, of living. That's the main aim for this. Thank you very much. This next question is from an anonymous um, submission who says, my question is, why do some of us experience such a harsh re-entry to our physical bodies when we return from our NDEs? So I guess it just varies from person to person and it also depends on the way in which we had our NDE. Um, mine was different in that I had a slow and painful and gradual death. My death was leading up to it was very fearful and very painful for a prolonged period of time. But I had a very gentle re-entry. Um, some people, they have something like maybe a cardiac arrest and they suddenly leave their bodies and then perhaps they suddenly come back into their bodies or they, it might happen during a car crash. I think a lot depends on the circumstances around and it also has a lot to do with modern medicine because if somebody is, um, somebody's body is being revived, like say with a defib defibrillator or um, they are being, their heart is getting started, then what happens is that when they suddenly, their body starts um, pumping oxygen again and they start breathing and their heart starts beating, then the, then the, the spirit or the life force is forced to just, just kind of rush back into the body. So I guess it depends, um, not knowing in your particular situation, I'm guessing that you had a near-death experience, which is what caused you to ask this question. Um, 
but I think that it probably has a lot to do with the physical um, surroundings of the near-death experience and the way that it happened to you. But it's a great question. Thanks. Jane says, since your NDE, have you had any other contact messages or signs from the other side? That's a great question because since my NDE, I would say it hasn't stopped. It really hasn't stopped. So the NDE was 13 years ago and my life has <laughs> only got better and better. Um, so it doesn't mean I don't get challenges. So believe me, it doesn't mean that and it doesn't mean that I am certain I won't face challenges and things won't happen to me. But um, what happens with a near-death experience? It's not like an experience, even though it's called an experience, it's not like a one-off experience like having a dream or something. It changes you. It changes you at your core, at a very fundamental level. And therefore, it changes the life that you bring to you because you are now operating very differently and from a very different level. Um, it's like a door that once you open it, it never closes. And so it's an awareness because there's like knowledge that you never knew before. And it's an awareness that um, once you know something, you can't unknow it. So you see life differently. And an analogy that I use to help people to really understand this is that if you imagine that, um, imagine that you were born blind your whole life um, and imagine that you've never ever had sight. If you've never had sight, think about um, the, think about how you would process life. Now I know that you would probably have, um, you would probably have a deeper sixth sense, uh, more intuition. However, think about all the things that you wouldn't be able to process because you didn't have um, you didn't, you've never had sight. So it would be hard for you to understand colors. It would ha be hard for you to differentiate if you were given two plates and you were told one is red, one is blue. Uh, you wouldn't be able to differentiate them by their color. If you were given two garments, two t-shirts and was told one is green, one is red and you, you wouldn't be able to differentiate them. You wouldn't be able to coordinate colors. You wouldn't be able to appreciate art as in um, as in graphic art, paintings, wall art, you wouldn't be able to appreciate things like that. You wouldn't understand if someone said the sky is blue or there's a bird in the sky. Um, it would be hard for you to conceptualize that buildings have stories, they have different levels, like oh there's a 12-story building. Um, it's hard for you to conceptualize what it really means unless you go and walk up the stairs and walk up, physically walk up the 12 floors. It's even hard for you to conceptualize from within an elevator what the elevator is really doing. So, um, and there are ways, of course, people have developed ways to teach people, but, um, but when you are blind, one of your senses is missing one of and maybe you developed your sixth sense but you still have only five senses so when you have an nde what it feels like is that you've been blind your whole life but suddenly you can see and you see that there is this whole other world if you will that exists simultaneously alongside ours so it's like being blind and then suddenly being able to see and realizing oh my gosh, this is so different from what I imagined. And imagine the clarity. It's like, oh, I understand now. I understand what colors are. I understand what happens when I get into an elevator. I understand what it means for a building to be 12 stories and the sky's blue and what it means for birds to fly and what are monarch butterflies and how they're different from other butterflies. And, and you know, suddenly there is this clarity. Now imagine if you go back to being blind Nothing can take away that sight from you. Even if you only had sight for 24 hours, 48 hours, nothing can take that away from you. You can't unsee it, you can't unknow it. But here's what happens. It changes your understanding of the world and the way it works. That's the main thing. It changes it and it may change the path you take in life. It'll change the way you conceptualize things and the way you operate and what you do and what you say. And now imagine if you were then, 
given um, after having sight for 48 hours, you were then given the job to go and teach people who have been blind their whole lives. And you then now were to go, because you had the experience of being blind your whole life, and you were then to tell them, okay, it's not what you think. It's not like, um, oh, it was a dream and now it's gone. It's actually something that exists right here and right now. That's what the blind person would be telling the other blind people. The blind person who had sight briefly would be telling the other blind people, um, just because I don't have sight anymore doesn't mean that everything I saw is gone. It's here, it's now, and I can show you how to navigate it. So that's kind of what it feels like. And so it can get frustrating when people say to me, no, you're lying, and no. It's, it's, so anyway, that's kind of what it's like. Thank you very much. If you're just joining us, we are here with Anita Morjani, learning about her upcoming course, Transforming Your Life Through Near-Death Experiences, which begins on Tuesday, June 25th. Please log on to ndetransformation.com for all of the details and to register. This next question is from Tatiana, who says, I'm struggling with things like the destruction of our beautiful nature and wars worldwide. I'm an empath, and therefore, I've already reduced watching the news, but it sometimes drives me crazy to watch people ignoring what our, planet's, our planet needs. Do you have a tip for how to deal with that? Okay, great question. I don't, I don't watch the news either. And for those of you who know me, you know that I'm an empath as well, and I speak to empaths, or a, a lot of my videos and speeches are for empaths. Um, and um, so I completely get where you're coming from, particularly when it comes about, uh, to the news. I was exactly like you that it used to get me down um, what was happening in the planet. But what I started to realize is that as an empath, not only are you receiving everybody's energy, which is what's bringing you down and watching everything that's happening and it gets you down to see other people who are being destructive, but also each and every one of us, we are transmitting energy. And whether we realize it or not, we are all affected by the energies of the people around us. And the only way we can actually transform the world is to raise our own energy and do whatever it takes to raise our energy. And um, a lot of people, particularly if you are somebody who is a people pleaser or a, um, someone I call, with all respect, I call doormats. I was one, so I say this with complete respect before my near-death experience. I was a doormat. I always worried about what people thought of me. And many uh, empaths have a tendency to become people pleasers and doormats because we always want everybody around us to feel good and we go out of our way to make people feel good. But what we forget is that in order to make people feel good, if we feel bad and if our energy is drained, we are not uplifting the planet. As much as we like to think we are, we can fool ourselves into thinking I'm out there and getting angry and rageful at all the people who are being destructive. Actually, we are adding to the destruction in a different way by bringing our anger and rage wherever we go um, because it's bringing us down. So what I tell people to do is that, of course, we need to change the planet and we need to bring about awareness and we need to um, even sometimes go out and protest and so on. Of course, things make us angry. But my point is, when you're angry inside, turn that anger, use that anger as fuel. Use it as fuel not to get angry at other people, but use it as fuel to come up with what people can do instead and go out in, in a state of love not in a state of rage and anger. Go out in a state of peace. And if you are somebody who is taking rage and anger out with you, that's your contribution to the world. And if someone else is acting towards you in rage and anger as if you are solely responsible for whatever it is, global warming or whatever, for something, an act you're doing, um, what you need to do is actually separate yourself from them because it can it can really bring you down 
Um, I truly believe in activism, but I believe in love activism or activism from a place of love. There is, um, we definitely need activism in this planet, but we really have to ask ourselves, are my actions coming from a place of love or are they coming from a place of fear? fear? When they're coming from a place of fear, yes, it could be fear for the planet. That's where it might start. But you then have to use that fear as fuel to transform it to a place of love. And then when you are coming from the place of love, that's when you take it out into the world and share it with people and tell people. How do you transform fear to love? Ask yourself, this brings me fear. What would I like to see instead? When you start visualizing what you would like to see instead and you get a clear picture, take that out into the world. To give you an example, um, I'm not a huge fan of the way that um, medicine or our medical model treats diseases like cancer. Um, deep down, it can make me enraged the way people get diagnosed from a state of fear and it brings them more fear because I know that that fear actually contributes to suppressing our immune system and you need your immune system when you're sick. And I, I hate all that, but I'm not going to go out and hate on doctors and hate on people and drug companies and pharma. No, I'm going to go out and advocate a different idea I have, a very different idea of how diseases such as cancer and all could be healed and how we could treat it differently and where the focus needs to be. And that uplifts me. It really uplifts me. And I love doing that so much more than focusing on what I believe the, the medical and the big pharma and all are doing. That drains me. And so I don't even go there. I go where this is what I'd rather see. This is what we need to spread. This is what we need to do. And that's what many of my videos and my work and all is about. It's what we need to do instead. So thank you for that wonderful question. Thank you. From Valmir, who says, can you speak more about your thoughts about concepts like heaven and hell? Okay, heaven and hell are here <laughs> on earth. They're not on the other side. Um, so um, we create it right here on earth. And um, I know that, of course, there will be people who will push back on that, but that's okay. Um, so on the other side, we have a state of non-duality where we completely understand why we did what we did. Any uh, any things that we've done completely wrong where we've hurt people and things like that, we get into the state of clarity where we completely understand why we did it wrong, why we did wrong and how we could have done it better. We get a chance to kind of um, self judge or atone or whatever we want to call it, but it's done in a very loving and compassionate way because people who hurt others do it from their own pain. They, um, we are, babies are not born evil. Negative things don't happen in a vacuum. Usually it's a whole series of things that happen that cause somebody to act out and do something that is heinous. It's, um, it, it's, it's not created in a vacuum. And of course people can do it differently and that's what they find out when they cross over or they feel remorse right here, which is even better. And we have l rules and laws and, um, and things like that um, to, to keep us in line over here. But you don't need that on the other side because on the other side, we have nothing to fear. There is nothing for people to kill or to take or to rape or to pillage. That, that, it can't even happen on the other side. So there is no heaven and hell. There is pure clarity. There is pure learning. There is pure... Um, just an understanding, there's compassion, there's empathy, and there is evolution. There is an understanding of, oh, how I could have done it better. Oh, wow, I thought I was really wrong in this, but no, actually, there was a reason for me doing that. And if we have spent a whole lifetime feeling guilty or remorseful for things, we then go across to the other side and we may feel, oh, I get why I did it. I didn't have to be that hard on myself. So different people, different things, but it's not 
heaven and hell. That's something we create right here. And um, I don't like the fear of hell. One of the things I don't like is when people fear hell and that's why they do good. I don't think that's a good reason to do good. You should do good just for goodness sake. We are all connected. We are all facets of one consciousness. And um, I use, usually use the example of fingers on a hand. Each, it's as if each one of us is a finger, believing that we are separate entities, separate from everyone else. And, when, and imagine if each of these fingers thought of the other fingers as enemies or competition or competitors, and we are constantly competing and trying to get ahead and getting angry and fighting. And it's only when we die do we realize that, oh my gosh, we're all part of one entity. If we all work together, think of how much stronger we could have been. We would have been one entity working together. So that's what we realize when we die. Over here, we use heaven and hell to get people to fear death or to fear doing negative things. We should just do good things for the sake of doing good things. The other thing we tell people is that if you take your life too soon, if you take your own life, in other words, if you commit suicide, you will go to hell or you will get bad karma, whatever it is. I don't like people to... I don't encourage people to not take their life because they fear the afterlife. They should not take their life because they have a passion for living. So if somebody is suicidal, do not make them fear the afterlife. On the contrary, help them to find passion in their life. Help them to love life again so that they want to live long. So thanks for that question. Thank you. This next question is a combination of a couple different questions that we've had coming in, um, which is, do you have any thoughts about why this NDE happened to you when it's not a common experience or something that happens to everyone else? Can you speak a little bit more about that? So I have a few reasons um, that I know. So number one is, People think that I am lucky or blessed because I had, because I got to come back. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe the people who stay there are lucky and blessed and I was not the lucky one. We have to stop thinking of people who passed on, uh, especially if they passed on from an illness, as having lost the battle. Maybe not. Their work was done. Mine wasn't done. So that's number one. Um, the other thing also is I believe that there are a lot of people who have had NDEs, but also I believe there are people who have had healings and things. And I will tell you one thing, it's very scary to step out and share it. I think I'm one of the very few people who has shared it and I don't blame people for not sharing it. I was naive, I started sharing it and then it was too late to go back in the closet. It literally is like coming out. Um, you get a lot of negative people, uh, a, a lot of um, negative feedback, you know, on social media, and it's pretty scary. And by the time I was out there sharing, it was too late. And but I did reach a point where I had to um, allow my story to go free, and I didn't put my whole full name on it. But I wanted to live my life detached from the story. But then Wayne Dyer discovered my story and had Hay House track me down and and put out and Hay House put out um, they had me write the book and put it out and then there was no hiding from it but if you want to really know why people don't come out uh, when they have stories like this like all you have to do is read some of the comments in my TED talk and um, uh, so I did a TED talk that has almost three million views and I'm putting myself out there right now, making myself vulnerable, um, is when you read the comments, yes, 70 or 80% of them are positive, but you know how it is. If you're an empath, all it takes is one negative comment and it makes you feel like you want to crawl under a rock. If you read the comments, um, about 10 or 15 or 20% of them are absolutely awful. I don't read them. I glanced at them once. I glance at them every um, several months. Um, but that is the kind of thing that will put people off sharing these kinds of experiences, which is why it's really, it's really sad. And that's why that these kinds of things are so slow in being spread in the world. Um, and what's interesting is that to me, what I experienced was very real. And if I go back to the analogy of 
the person, the blind person who suddenly had sight. Now I want you to imagine if, if that blind person lived in a world where everybody was blind and this world was created by blind people for blind people. And then you had a few of them, um, and one of them is me, but you had a few of them who had sight for a while. Uh, and then when they tried to explain it to everyone, all the blind people said, no, you're crazy, that's woo woo, you're a quack. And they made you feel crazy. And so even the ones that were able to see, they suppressed it, they hid it. That's what it feels like in this world. So I don't blame people for not sharing, but I think there are a lot more people than me. And the reason I share now is to give people permission. And why I'm excited about doing this course and other things I'm doing is because when you're in a private arena, like in a course where people want to go deep, they are interested. You're not in the public arena where you attract all the other comments and negative comments and so on, which make people clam up, you know, because a negative comment like that, someone who brings you down like that, it kind of ends the conversation. But in a course like this, you can go really deep and the conversation doesn't end. You know, it can go as deep as the participants are willing for it to go. And so the people who take courses like this are people who are passionate and they want to know more and they want to go deeper. Then what happens is that you're all on this kind of energy high and that's when real magic can happen. Thank you. Marie says, I have suffered from debilitating anxieties since childhood. I'm now 50 years old and have lost hope that I can live a life of peace. Do you have any hope that you can share with me to help me heal? I no longer believe that it is possible. Aw, well, if you were right here, I would give you a big hug. I'm sending you a virtual hug right now, Marie. Um, so what the, the hope I would give you is, first of all, yes, there is hope. As long as there is breath, there is hope. My sense from your question is that you are being hard on yourself. And my sense is that you have, over the years, accumulated a lot of um, beliefs, a lot of baggage beliefs, and you're still still living through that. So what we tend to do is that we tend to... Um, we tend to accumulate a lot of beliefs that we live our life through and this colors our vision or our lens of life. So it's like we add more and more layers to who we are. Your soul, the reason why you are feeling that way um, is because your soul is crying to be set free and it doesn't know how to. And so what I would ask you to do, I'm gonna tell you a tip that would help you. I think it would help you right away is I want you to ask yourself, what have I taken on that is not mine? In other words, what have I said yes to that I should have said no? Because your body is um, weighing your soul down um, because you have been doing things and living a life that is not your life. So you are not going through a mental crisis, you're going through a spiritual crisis. I think we very often label mental health problems and mental crises as mental crises, but in, actually, in actuality, it's usually our spirit that's feeling, hey, this is not the life I signed up for. This is not the life I'm living. So the way to really get rid of the layers, to undo all the stuff you've been doing and to see through a clearer lens is to let go of what is not you. So every day it's like, what have I taken on that's not mine? Um, what are the dramas I've bought into or I'm involved in that are actually not mine? What have I said yes to that I didn't want to, that I should have, excuse me, that I should have said no to. Those are the questions you need to be asking yourself. And if you follow that and you follow through, uh, you, will, you will come out of it. So thanks. Thanks for that question. I think it probably helped a lot of people. Thank you. 
We're going to have time for one or two more questions, but before we take those, I just want to mention transforming your life through near-death experiences one more time. This is going to be a life-changing five-week journey under Anita's guidance, where we will develop a deep and holistic understanding of the practices and principles needed to engage transforming your life through near-death experiences with transformative power. This five-week course takes place on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific, starting Tuesday, June 25th. If for any reason you cannot, oop, hold on, <laughs> I had a scroll down issue. If for any reason you cannot join us live, you won't miss the teachings. You will receive replays, transcripts, and all course handouts via your course homepage. Also, I would like to remind you that we offer a no-risk money-back guarantee on our courses, giving a full two weeks until July 9th in this case to make sure that you absolutely love it. And as an added option, all participants are welcome to connect via a private Facebook community group so you can stay in contact with one another and support one another through the course. Everyone who registers receives the Transforming Your Life Through Near-Death Experiences bonus collection, which includes Healthcare or Illness Scare, a video teaching from Anita, Embracing the Healer Within, a guided audio meditation from Anita and Barry Goldstein, and When Everything is Illuminated, Dispelling the Myth of Separation, which is an excerpt from Anita's book, What If This is Heaven. Anita, can you share a little bit about what you are most looking forward to offering in the course? Oh, this so much. I'm looking forward to going deeper, diving deeper. I'm looking forward to taking people on actual journeys. So the first thing um, that I'm going to be doing in the first lesson is I'm going to take people on their own simulated uh, near-death experience. And so we're going to open with that. And so I tend to do things the opposite of what most other people do, um, because sometimes people will say, oh, you should save that for last. That should be the finale. No, I actually want to open with that. I want to open with the near-death experience. So the first one will literally be a journey into your own near-death experience um, where we will take you on a, uh, I will guide you through that journey. It'll be an experiential journey where you can feel that expansive state. We will be bringing in music, sound healing music, which you will hear through your computer or whatever you're using to tune into this. And the healing music is also purpose purposefully designed for healing. And also I will be using the right words to take you into that state. Um, many people who have transformative experiences, that's only one part of the equation. The second part of the equation is integrating back into life with that experience, which is why I want to do the experience first, because then it gives us the four weeks later to help us to integrate it. Integrating is the big challenge, and this is why a lot of people, when they've had some kind of transformation in their life, they find it hard to hold on to because they want to fit back in, just like what I was saying earlier with everyone else con you know, convincing them that, oh, you're not being real realistic and you got to get back into life. So this is where I really love to support people is through, um, through helping them to take that experience and applying it into their life. That is what I have been doing all these years. And when I had the experience, there were no tools per se to do that. Um, you can go for, um, for meditation, kundalini, whatever to, to have the experience, but then how do you integrate it into, into your life? And so that's the part that, um, that I, I also like to focus on. Um, the other thing that I'm really looking forward to is I'm going to conduct an energy experiment where people are going to have breakout groups and this is what I'm really looking forward to and why it's going to be so fun to do an online thing because up until now I have only been able to do this kind of thing in my live workshops for the last five six years that's what I've been doing I've been traveling and traveling and doing these live courses and live workshops and seminars because 
the things I do are about, we go deep, um, we go on journeys, we do energy experiments where you get into groups and you actually work on healing each other or uplifting each other. And it really works because energy is real and you get to experience it for real. And so um, it's not something I've ever been able to do just via regular video or on social media. So I am really excited to try this online course because if I can do this online, it means that I can deliver it to people who can't travel to my workshops. And I know that, um, I know that the technology now um, allows me to do this, to get people into breakout groups. And remember, energy can travel any distance. So the kind of energy we can create especially if we come together from all over the world, could be quite incredible. And that's what I'm really excited about. And it'll be a concentrated energy of everybody kind of on the same wavelength, thinking the same way. So I think um, I am actually really excited about it myself. That's beautiful. And our final question is from Rose, who says, Dearest Anita, how, how can we know our eternal part so we can love ourselves unconditionally? When I go inside, I find that there is just a void. Should we just chill in the void and wait for it to announce itself? Is there a particular technique? Thank you. So again, another great question. So there is no harm in just chilling in the void. But if you are finding that you're chilling in the void too long and you're getting impatient, um, the way that you can actually get to know your internal self. So your eternal self is there all the time. Um, my sense is that you haven't heard it or listened to it or haven't noticed it. Let's just say you haven't noticed it. And um, I like to describe it as we are the tip of the iceberg. We, so your physical body, your physical self, who we think is all we are, most people out there, we think that this is all we are, we're a physical body. But in actuality, the real us is much bigger than the physical body. So I liken it to an iceberg. When you take a photo of an iceberg, all you're actually looking at is the tip. Whereas the tip of the iceberg is only 10 or 20% of the actual iceberg. There's way more iceberg below the water, which you can't even see. It's the same with us. There's way more of us, which is above or beyond the physical three-dimensional world, which we can see, hear, feel, taste, and touch. And that is the fourth dimension or the sixth sense, there is more of us that exists beyond this three-dimensional. So the idea is to get in touch with that. It's about getting in touch with the rest of the iceberg. So become aware of that first of all. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is to know that even the thoughts you're having, the inspirations, the creation, the creativity is coming from the greater part of you, the it's coming from that rest of the iceberg. That, and that iceberg is what's connected to the universal energy. So know that even your creativity. So you can actually, like there are ways to kind of um, lodge that creative part of you so that when you go still and sit inside, you will feel more messages. Um, and it's by doing certain things. My sense from your question is that the life that you're living right now perhaps you haven't fully exploited your creativity. So what I would encourage you to do is to start doing one creative thing every day. The best way to unlock your connection with your higher self is by doing at least one creative thing every single day. And when I say that, it could be anything like um, drawing, painting, cooking something that you make up the recipe for. So it's not about f following a recipe book, but cooking something from scratch that you completely create um, from, from your head. You just decide, okay, I'm gonna put these ingredients and you just kind of do it like an artist. That's how I cook, by the way. Um, I don't follow recipes, but, um, and it could, or you could do some kind of handicraft or some kind of home tech or anything that's 
absolutely creative or it could be to write a poem or to write an essay or to write a blog. So it's not limited. But if you can actually include in your regime as part of your daily practice, you know, we do our daily, whether it's exercise, yoga or daily meditation, we all have our daily routine. If you can include in your daily routine one act of creativity where I created something, preferably I created something from scratch every single day, what you will find is that you will unlock that connection. So it's not even just about unlocking your creativity, but where does creativity come from? It doesn't come from this physical body and this physical brain. It comes from your higher connection. And so it's about unlocking that and and exercising that. It feels like that's a muscle that hasn't been exercised for you yet. So just unlock that by doing one creative act every single day. And thank you for that question, Rose. And and there were a lot of great questions and I really appreciate all of them. This has been a wonderful hour with you, Anita, and thank you to everyone for being with us and to you, Anita, for sharing your wisdom and your compassion with all of us on the call today. Transforming Your Life Through Near-Death Experiences starts next week, Tuesday, June 25th. And again, please visit ndetransformation.com to learn more and to register. And Anita, do you have any final words that you would like to share with our listeners? Um, some final, I guess my final words would be, um, don't take life too seriously. Lighten up, have fun, laugh. Laughter really, really is the best medicine. Um, and eat chocolate. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. On behalf of everyone at the Shift Network, I wish you well. And we look forward to having you on this course and or another one in the future. Take care.